It's been one year since our world stopped. One year since time stood still. One year since our hearts were shattered into so many pieces that we weren't even sure if they could ever recover. We come together tonight not just to reflect on the past in pain, but to look ahead toward the future with faith and fortitude. As Jewish people, we are no strangers to tragedy. But we always, always have risen above. We cry, we mourn, and we take action. Tonight will be a night of action. Today we stand in the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the 10 holy days of judgment, where God decides who will live and who will die, who will prosper and who will suffer, who will succeed and who will fail. And it is this weekend on Yom Kippur that world Jewry will declare, as we have on Rosh Hashanah, the three secrets that we know to avert the evil decree. Useshuva, usefila, utsedaka. By coming back to our authentic selves with prayer and with tragedy, with, I'm sorry, with charity, we are assured a blessed year. Tonight, our aim is to incorporate these three pillars so that we are not merely spectators on the sidelines, but warriors in a battle that we will win. We will be inspired with Torah. We will light candles in memoriam of the precious lives lost. We will pray for our valiant soldiers and for the 101 so uh, hostages who still languish in Hamas terror dungeons 365 days later. And we will also have an opportunity to give charity in a real way to help the war effort going on today as we speak. So let us begin. I'd like to call upon Rabbi David Vigler to start us off with the first of these three pillars. Thank you, Hannah. Though this has been a year so tough, so painful, so dark, 101 of our brothers and sisters still languishing in the Hamas dungeons and under Gaza, we can't ignore the miracles that have arisen in recent weeks and months. Like flashes of lightning in a dark storm, we can't but notice the extraordinary events surrounding our people. In the past year, over 26,000 rockets have been fired at tiny Israel with her densely populated urban centers from every single direction. Logically, all projections would have expected catastrophic results. But we can't but notice how the results have been extraordinarily underwhelming. Just last week, when Iran fired nearly 200 ballistic missiles in Israel, each one of these lethal weapons capable of devastating a 1.3 kilometer radius, it landed on a school, a Chabad school in Gedera, 
Just moments earlier, the school children were building shofars happily in preparation for Rosh Hashanah. Yet miraculously, they had managed to vacate the building a short while before the building was devastated by the ballistic missile, leaving a huge crater in the place where the children were building shofars a little while earlier. 2,000 years from now, our descendants will talk about the miracles of today's rockets as we talk about the miracles of the splitting of the Red Sea and the exodus from Egypt because indeed we are experiencing modern day miracles. Join me in acknowledging the divine intervention in these dark days. One line that defines our faith, one line that was the last word spoken by so many of the victims on October 7th. Shema Yisrael means hear, O Israel, but it's actually an acronym for Se'u Marom Eneichem, the challenge of Isaiah in chapter 40, to lift up our sights, to broaden our horizons, to raise our perspectives, and to see the bigger picture at play, to open our eyes, and to see the hidden miracles that surround us. Shema Yisrael is a call to open our eyes. The greatest lights require vision, not just sight. Faith is the ability to see the light with your heart when all your eyes can see is darkness. And that's why we cover our eyes in our holiest moments. When we're lighting Shabbos candles, the blessing of the priests, the brides veiled under the chuppah and the Shema Yisrael. Please join me as we raise our right hand and we cover our eyes in a global affirmation of Shema Yisrael. Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, in faith we stand. God is in control, guiding our hand. Every detail, every road is His design. In His plan we trust. In the end it will align. No random paths, no chance nor fate. Each moment is bashert, it's never late. So breathe in peace. Let worries go. Embrace the journey. Trust in the flow. It's been sensational to see these miracles, but they're not enough. We need to finish the job. We need to solicit divine intervention to bring back our hostages home and to bless our soldiers with extraordinary success in their work. Join us as we pray for Chayalei Tzeva Haganali Israel, the soldiers of the Israel Defense Force. Shebeirach Avoteinu Abraham Yitzchak Ve'yakov U'yevarech Et chayalei Tzva hagana Adonai, 
לטובנו. הקמים עלינו ניגפים אל יפניהם. הקדוש ברוך הוא ישמר ויאציל את חיילינו מכל צרה וצוקה ומכל נגע המחלה וישלח ברכה והצלחה בכל מעשה ידיהם ידבר שונאיהם תחתיהם ויעטרם בקטע ישוע ובעטר את ניצחון וכהן בהם הכתוב כי אדוני אלוהיכם ההולך עמכם I'd like to share with you the, sh- the secret, the Jewish secret to victory over our enemies. It's the story of the only time in the past 3,337 years when there were no Jews living in the land of Israel for a period of 52 years. It all started in the year 423 BCE after the Babylonian conquest of our first temple in Jerusalem. When the Babylonians allowed just 6,000 Jews to live in Israel, mostly farmers, responsible for growing food for the Babylonian troops, they appointed a Jewish leader by the name of Gedaliah to rule over the Jewish people with loyalties to the Babylonian emperor. Another Jew by the name of Yishmael found it distasteful that Gedaliah was loyal to the Babylonian invaders, and shockingly, he decided to murder Gedalia on the feast of Rosh Hashanah. Gedalia knew he was warned about this, but he refused to believe that a fellow Jew would do such a thing. As a result, the Jews were expelled from the land of Israel with no Jews living there, all the way through till 371 BCE when they returned to rebuild that temple. Ever since then, we fast on the day after Rosh Hashanah to remind us that eternal lesson with the dangers of Jewish infighting The fast on the day after Rosh Hashanah, the fast of Gedalia reminds us that we can't ever lose sight of our national unity because when we do, we turn on each other instead of our enemies. The results were devastating, banishing us from our homelands. October 7th did not happen in a vacuum. It was the result of months of Jewish, Jewish infighting. If you remember what happened beforehand with religious divides, countless elections and judicial reforms that threatened to tear our nation asunder and that's exactly what they caused on October 7th. Moses, the greatest leader our people have ever known, is introduced to us in the Torah with two stories that define the challenges of our nation. The first is a story of anti-Semitism, the second is a story of Jewish infighting. In the first story, Moses encounters an anti-Semite attacking a Jew. He takes decisive action and he neutralizes the anti-Semite. He kills him. In the second story, Moses sees a Jew attacking another Jew. He's rendered speechless. He's paralyzed. He does not know what to do. Because when anti-Semites rise up against us, Moses is teaching us to be fearless and unapologetic in rising up to strike our enemies first if there is no other option. But when it comes to Jewish infighting, there is simply no option. Moses did not want, know what to do. He ran away, allowing the Jewish people to languish in exile for another 60 years before his return at the burning bush. The two critical lessons we learned from these encounters is that whilst anti-Semitism might be more painful, Jew on Jew hatred is far more lethal. Moses was not intimidated by anti-Semitism, but when he, when he encountered internal conflict amongst the people, that rendered him speechless, leading to endless suffering. 18 months ago, former Prime Minister of Israel, Naftali Bennett, came to visit us here in Palm Beach. 
He told us about the many abusers that our nation has endured and survived. From the Babylonians to the Persians to the Greeks and the Romans to the Nazis, the Cossacks, and fundamentalist Islam amongst others. We were able to outlive them all, but no one damaged us as much as we were damaged by inner conflict. He told us that in our history, there were only two times when we had self-governance in our promised land. The first one in the year 869 BCE, when King David and King Solomon ruled over the land for 81 years until the son, the son of Solomon divided the land into two kingdoms and it all fell apart. The second time was after the Hanukkah story in the year 140 BCE when the two princes of the house of Hasmonean, and the Maccabee kings, Horkonos and Aristobulus, two brothers, they couldn't figure it out. They were fighting until one of them solicited the Roman general Pompey to mediate, sensing the vulnerability of the brokenness of the people. He decided to invade and throw them both out turning the promised land into a Roman vassal state. Naftali Bennett, 18 months ago, warned us that today we stand in the third era of Jewish self-governance in the promised land. Since 1948, it's been 75 years, and we are in grave danger, he said, of facing the same result. How prophetic his words. Democracy is not enough. Democratic values is not enough to keep us united. Just like in an army, it's not enough that each man is allowed to do whatever he wants. We need to share a common purpose, a common passion, a common assignment. The same goes for a business. You can't just let each employee do what they want. We have to have a shared vision statement, a mission statement, and a values declaration. As Jews, too, we share a constitution. It's the Torah, and the values are our mitzvahs which bind us with a shared passion and purpose that unites us in an unbreakable bond. Former Gaza hostage, Sapir Cohen, tells the story after she was rescued of how one day in captivity, her Hamas captor called her over to the television to show her a pro-hostage demonstration in Tel Aviv. Thousands of Jews were rallying in support of the hostages. And the captor said to her, when your people are united, you are so strong. The terrorists know this truth. The big question is if we. We're standing just a month before the national elections here in the United States. This is the most divisive time for us as American Jews this is the time when we must rise up above our preferences and learn to love the people that we don't like. You don't have to agree with them. You just have to learn to accept them as your brother and your sister. And I know you'll tell me, but that person, I can't tolerate their political views. It's a test, my friends. God is testing you to see if you can remain united, if we can stand united, because united we stand and God forbid, divided we fall. We today can bring God to the battlefield. Just like parents care more than anything else, they want their children to get along with each other. Our Father in heaven too wants nothing more than us Jews to learn to live with each other, to love each other, even if we might not like each other. Indeed, in today's Torah portion, the Torah tells us, Vayhi bishurun melech, that the king dwells amongst the people, yacha the shivte Yisrael, when it is that we're able to stand united. Now is our time to stand united as one, one spelt W-O-N. The Torah tells us, call Yisrael, Arevim, Zebazeh, all of Israel are responsible one for another. When I ask my fellow Jews here, elder Jews in this, era, in this community, what were you doing during the Holocaust in Europe when you were here in America? Many of them tell me we didn't know. We just didn't know what the Nazis were doing. But today we know of the atrocities that are happening to our brothers in Israel. Today we know about the suffering, what's going on in the land of Israel. Today, we have to do something about it. 
What will you tell your grandchildren that you did after October 7th on the first anniversary? Will you have the courage to rise up and stand united with your fellow brother and your fellow sister, even if you don't agree with them? We can do this. We can win this war. Am Yisrael Chai. In May of 1957, the little fledgling town of Kfar Chabad in Israel was reeling from a terrible tragedy. Terrorists had infiltrated, gotten into the agricultural school, and murdered five students and their teacher. This was a major blow for this tiny community who was mostly made up of people who had themselves survived and fled the pogroms in Russia. And now, how were they going to endure this excruciating pain? They wrote a telegram to the Rebbe, hoping, to the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rebbe Menachem Schneerson, hoping that he would send back some words of comfort. Four agonizing days later, a telegram came back, a response came with three succinct words. Behemshech habinyan tenuchamu. By continuing the building, you will be comforted. And in fact, they did build a brand new school and slowly their spirits were lifted. After October 7th, there was so much outrage. And I remember hearing people say, but we've said never again. How can this happen? Never again doesn't mean that our enemies will never try to annihilate us again. Never again doesn't mean that we won't be seeing protesters on the streets of the civilized world chanting for the death of Jews or praising the next intifada. Never again means that we will never again go like sheep to the slaughter. Never again will six million of us march helplessly to the gas chambers. Today, we will defend ourselves. Today, we have an army with our own uniform and our own weapons. Today, we have the bravest soldiers in the world who are not just fighting Israel's war, but are fighting the war of good against evil and freedom over tyranny. For me, this is very personal. As my baby brother, my youngest brother, Shmaya, was deployed to the Lebanon border on Erev Rosh Hashanah, he left his wife and their three little children to go and fight. And yesterday, he and his brigade entered enemy territory. We pray for him and all of the soldiers. And God willing, they will all come back safely. For this past year, Chabad of Palm Beach Gardens has been on the front lines, sending drones to Israel, aiding in the effort against the terrorists, against the enemy. The words of the Rebbe ring ever so strongly. By in the continuation of the building, will you be comforted? Through action, we can achieve victory. On this auspicious day of October 7th, we invite you to channel your emotion into action. You can make a difference right here, right now. Six months ago, we went to the Gaza border and spoke to the generals of the IDF Southern Command. This is what they had to say. We're going to win this war for sure, because this is a, it's going to be a long, long war. It seems like it's one, because all of our enemies woke up one day <laughs> together saying, hey, the Jews are not supposed to be here. And they have some more ideas. They're not supposed to exist here, and I think in other places in the world. It's, it's like Nazism is coming back. We woke up again. Nazism. Yeah, yeah. 
We were just in Nova. Yeah. I felt like we were in Auschwitz. It is. This is the Gaza border, guys. Instead of having physical soldiers that are looking that are in danger from tunnels, terrorists coming out of nowhere. Each camera is instead of four soldiers. Each camera is instead of four physical soldiers that their life, their life would be in danger. How many cameras do you need? We gave one camera system two weeks ago the special unit of the Nahal, and after a day, because of this uh, system, they caught 50 terrorists. Wow. After a day, not even a day wow. passed. That's was, amazing. Yeah, amazing. That's amazing. And, and we could, and at night we saw it on the news. There is some military gear that could uh, uh, make life easier for the for the soldiers. Drones can help a lot because they give the, uh, our, our forces more um, uh, abilities for uh, understanding what's happening in a, in a very huge place. One thing that everybody should know is that drones is the number one weapon of this war. Okay. Number one weapon. One's the heart. The help that you give us uh, over the sea from the United States, uh, or the help you gave us really saved soldiers' lives and helped us to do our uh, missions better. So thank you very much from uh, the Brigade 97. Can I give it to you? This thank is you here much. to present uh, from the Chabad of Hamishwarim, protecting the uh, soldiers of the IDF, this is the religious brigade, bringing together Torah and uh, the religious Judaism and nationalism and spiritual, all together protecting the people of Israel. I'm Israel Chai. We stand with you. We're fighting alongside you because you have our backs and we have your backs. Being connected to one another is the main thing. Being connected, wow, that's the, the, the spirit, the Jewish spirit is the most important thing. Mark Linsky will light the first candle. Good. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. And once again, welcome to our Chabad of Palm Beach Gardens a place where we gather strength in the face of crisis. The outpouring of concern from our Jewish and non-Jewish friends has been nothing short of tremendous. And I'm here tonight to explain to you exactly how you can help the men and women on the front lines of both the southern and the northern borders of Israel directly. Because of my affiliation with the Chabad, on almost a daily basis, people ask me pretty much three basic questions. Number one, what can I do to help? Number two, how do I go about helping? And number three, where is my money actually going? So I would like to address these three questions. Our Chabad, of Palm Beach Gardens, and our rabbi, Rabbi David Bigler, in particular, is in direct contact with the IDF commanders in Gaza and on the border of Lebanon. How awesome is that? I walked into his office once, and he was talking to one of the commanders on the telephone. And they have specifically requested from us two different kinds of drones that they desperately need at this time. The first kind of drone that they need 
is something called a mini surveillance drone or a life-saving drone. The second type of drone that they need desperately right now is called a thermal night vision drone. My friends, we have already donated over 100 drones thanks to so many people's desire to help, which has already saved so many soldiers' lives, while at the same time extinguishing the lives of the enemy, which you're going to witness with your very own eyes tonight on a video that we're going to present to you later on this evening. In terms of cost, it's simple. Each mini surveillance drone costs $1,200. Each thermal night vision drone costs $12,000. These drones are vital, my friends, because they're often destroyed by the enemy and they need to be replaced. Now, what I want to emphasize to you tonight is that every dollar that you donate will go directly to the front lines and will have a major impact on the protection of our soldiers and on winning the war. This is in no way, no shape or form, a Chabad fundraiser. I want to wait for Yom Kippur for that one. I'm coming to get you. But tonight, it's all about supporting the IDF by supplying them with these particular drones that they need, that they requested. These drones are literally the eyes and the ears of the soldiers, and with your donations, you can help them and keep them safe. And all donations matter, big and small. It could be $18, it could be $18,000, and anything in between. What matters most is tonight, the anniversary of October 7th, that we have a collective commitment right here in the shul and also from everybody watching at home to supply the IDF with the drones that they need to win the war. So how do we do it? Super easy. Normally I would tell you to put your phones away when I talk, but tonight, take your phones out. It's super easy. If I can do it, you can do it. You just go to your phone. We call this texting by pledge. I'm sorry. We call this text to pledge. And all you do is go to your messages. The key to this is to hit that little box on the top. I didn't know how to do that earlier. And you just type in the phone number. You can see the phone number up there. It says 856-386-1690. 856-386-1690. And in the message part, just write victory. Hit the send button and then follow the process. Super easy. Now, if you're watching from home, another way to do this is through our QR program where we have a QR code. Take your phone, zoom in, hit the button. You'll see four yellow brackets. Hit the button and then follow along with the process. That's how easy it is, folks. Please, we need your help. As the Rebison said, tonight is a memorial, but it's also a day of action. Thank you so much. And at this time, I would like to reintroduce my friend and tonight's master of ceremony, Mr. Sid Dinerstein. Cong <clears throat> Congressman Brian Mass was originally going to be here, and very recently he got called away. <clears throat> and quite frankly, we're not quite sure where in the world he got called away to. So we asked him if he would do a video reflecting his connection, not just to the, uh, the Jewish community, but to the IDF who he fought side by side with. So who's ever in charge of the videos? The Brian Mass video, please.
Number one, thank you all for the invitation. I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person. The world has me in other places. My duties have me in other places. But I always love being with you in person, and I can't wait until the next time that we do get to be together, that we do get to break bread with one another. Rabbi Wiegler, thank you always for giving me the invites to, to join you all, to have conversation with you all about whatever's going on around the globe and around the world with Israel in the United States of America, covering so many different issues. I couldn't appreciate it more, and, and I hope that all those that I would call a part of your flock appreciate that as well, because the fact of the matter is not every Chabad out there participates in the same level that you participate in, and it definitely doesn't go unnoticed by me. So thank you for your engagement. As we speak about October 7, I reflect on October 7 in this way. It was an invasion, yes, but it was far more than that. It was an attack, yes, but it was far more than attack. It was murder, yes, but it was far more than just murder. It was torture, but it was far more than torture. The October 7 events were by every definition a genocide. If the Palestinian people and the terrorist groups that are a part of them, whether that be Hamas, whether that be Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, Lion's Den, Fatah, or, or so many that don't even necessarily identify with one of those terrorist organizations, if they could have made the number six million Jews, they would have made the number six million Jews. If they could have made the number killed and captured every single Jew across the globe, they would have done so, and they would have celebrated. For my part, I will always recognize who the enemy is. I will make sure that our yes is yes, and our no is no, as the United States of America. I can't tell you that that will be the same commitment that you have from this administration right now, where, unfortunately, as we've seen, there has not been every commitment to make sure that every even American that was captured is brought home by Americans. That's not a commitment that we have in this moment, or that their bodies are brought home by Americans for those that have already been killed. That's not a commitment that we have right now. But for my part, I will work to make sure that Israel has our support, that Americans abroad have America's support to bring them home, and that every enemy of both Israel and the United States of America knows that we do stand together, that we do work together, and that we will eliminate the enemy together. Whether that enemy is Hamas, whether that enemy is Hezbollah, whether that enemy is supported by Iran or anybody else, we will eliminate that enemy. Hezbollah is also the enemy, as we all know. And it's important to recognize that in the, in the wave, in the days after October 7, it was Hezbollah that was attacking from the north from those days after right up until right now. It was in all likelihood entirely calculated between one another to conduct these attacks simultaneously, to work together against Israel to kill as many Jews as possible. They have the same goal. They share that in common. In this fight, Hezbollah has to be looked at just as much as an Iranian military asset as we would look at the Quds Force, as we would look at the IRGC. It is like the Hezbollah Iranian infantry unit that's simply operating on the Lebanon border. They are a part of Iran. For anybody that goes out there and tries to tell us that we should worry about the escalation in a broader way in that region, it's important for those people to recognize that every single time that a Hezbollah fighter is taken off the battlefield, or every single time a Hamas fighter is taken off the battlefield, or one of their vehicles, or one of their ordnance, or one of their rifles, Israel is eliminating the capability for that war to expand because they are eliminating an Iranian fighter. They are eliminating the enemy. And the more of them that we eliminate, the less likelihood that there is an expansion of that battle because eventually we know that they run out of fighters. We know that they run out of leaders. We owe Israel a thanks for their commitment in combat. They are absolutely eliminating crossing off names, enemies of the United States of America, those that have participated in killing Americans all the way back to the bombings of Beirut. We have Israel to thank for taking those enemies off the table, for crossing their names off the list, for putting them into multiple pieces on the side of a road or inside of a building somewhere.
I couldn't be happier that they did that. They will continue to have my support to do that for every enemy of Israel and every enemy of the United States of America. They're doing work that the United States of America should be doing on that front and so many other fronts. I ask myself often why we don't see a flow chart ourselves of those names that America has crossed off the list of the Houthi leadership that are attacking our vessels, attacking our Navy vessels, attacking our shipping vessels. We don't see that because there's not the same commitment. That's not my approach to this. My approach is to destroy our enemies, but that is the situation that we have going on with the administration that we have in place right now. That has to change. I will work to make sure that that change from my part takes place. There are more allies than just me in this fight, and I want to tell you all that because I want you to know that I want you to have that, that encouragement that Israel is not alone. Israel has friends. Israel has friends in the United States House of Representatives, in the Senate, and Israel has friends in this administration as well, albeit an administration that, again, many of their actions do not make sense to me, and I don't think they lead to the point of the yes has to be yes, the no has to be no. In the aim of my yes being yes and my no being no, I will say this one more time, Israel has my full support. I was honored to serve alongside the fighters of Israel back in 2015. I still have many friends there. I was honored to return to Israel just the last holiday season to visit with injured service members like myself that were at hospitals across the country, give them the encouragement that life will go on, that they will recover, that they will learn to walk again, that they will be with their kids, they will be with their family, they will grow their families, and they will make new memories and they will continue to be in the fight in whatever way that they choose to be. It's important for all of us to remember that as a message as well, that even though that we go through these dark times, it's going through that fight that ultimately makes us the strongest that we've ever been. Israel chooses to go through the fight. They don't turn their back. They don't cower in fear. They don't curl up into a corner and start crying. They look at the enemy, they take assessment of the enemy's capabilities, they own the enemy, and they give the enemy a size 10 in the backside, and they never look back. And that's why Israel continually becomes stronger in the face of these conflicts, and I couldn't be more proud of them for that attitude that they have day in, day out. For me, again, as always, I would just tell you, I'm sorry that I can't be there in person with you. It is an honor to represent you. I always look forward to being with you. I look forward to have the invitation to join you again and I wish you all the best. Thank you, Brian. The next candle is gonna be lit by a 20-year friend of mine, the Sheriff of Palm Beach County, Rick Bradshaw. I am deeply honored to be here with you tonight. I've only got a couple minutes to talk, but there are some things that are important for you to know. Number one, the fight against anti-Semitism for me is a priority. We have drawn a bright red line in the sand. And my message today and to the bad guys always is, you cross that line, I will put your butt in jail. It's that simple. It's a zero tolerance. But the other thing you need to know is I'm still the chairman of Homeland Security for all of South Florida. We have a vast intelligence gathering system. We network with all the Jewish intelligence information, the FBI, Homeland Security out of Washington. We have people in the National Inter uh, Inter Information Center. So I know what's going on in the world. Ten minutes after this thing happened over there, I ordered that every temple, every synagogue, will have increased security until we get back to normal days. And you know why that's important? Because the bad guys want you to be afraid. Don't be afraid. We will protect you. We will keep you safe. That's why we have a high-profile image every single time. We know when the high holy days are. We even ramp up more than that. 
So please, feel safe to worship, and I promise you this, I will keep you and your family safe. Thank you. The next candle will be lit by, lit by our state representative, Mike Caruso. Thank you, Sid. Thank you, Rabbi members, for inviting me here today. I am very honored. A year ago, the world changed. On October 7th, we witnessed an unprecedented attack by terrorists, by Hamas, by evil, soulless men, an attack that shook the foundation of the values we treasure, that shook the foundation of humanity itself. Over 1,200 innocent lives were lost, and men, women, children, even an infant was taken as hostage, hostages, leaving families shattered and a nation in despair. This act of violence was not just an attack on Israel, it was an attack on every Jew throughout the world. Today, Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, and others seek to exterminate Jews worldwide. They are fighting for land that is not theirs, while Israel fights for its life. And over the past 365 days, these terrorists have fired tens of thousands of missiles at Israel. They fire them from schools, hospitals, and even their mosque. Missiles not aimed at Israeli military targets, but aimed at innocent, peace-loving people of Israel. Yet somehow, the world is taking up the course that these murderous cowards are the good guys, while Israel is bad. Israel is wrong. Israel is to blame, and Israel is the aggressor. Well, we know that that is not true. We know that it is just an extension of the rising scourge of anti-Semitism throughout the world, a scourge that has persisted for centuries, for millenniums. We see it in hate-filled rhetoric, acts of violence, campus protests, and insidious discrimination. Today, former New York Times journalist Barry Weiss wrote, we expected Hamas to kill Jews. What we didn't expect was for Americans to celebrate it. And that's why today, even more now than ever, we must confront anti-Semitism head on. We must unite against the rising tide of hatred and challenge the narrative that fuels it. We must be vocal towards our opposition and we must provide safety for Jews and Jewish communities. We must educate American children on the Holocaust and on how one ounce of hatred can lead to the deaths of millions. Florida has been a leader in supporting Jews, fighting anti-Semitism, and standing for Israel. We won't tolerate evil in Florida, and I, as your state representative, vow to continue this fight and ensure that Florida is an example to the world. In 2023, when I presented HB 269, anti-Semitism is a hate crime on the Florida House floor, I did so on the 80th anniversary of the Warsaw Uprising, where Jews imprisoned in the Polish ghettos valiantly, yet desperately, fought back against the Nazis. Today, on October 7th, we need to fight back. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to be bold. It is time to take action. It is time to speak out. In the words of Prime Minister Netanyahu, Israel will never go quietly in the night. Today, total victory for Israel is the only answer. So let us pray that Israel and all Jews throughout the world and here in America go on shining brightly in the light today, tomorrow, and forever. Thank you. The next candle will be written, will be lit by the police chief of Palm Beach Gardens, Dominic Pape.
Good evening. Rabbi Vigler, thank you for this opportunity. A year ago, Israel was attacked by evil. It was their 9-11 event. We must never forget the massacre which murdered 1,200, injured thousands, kidnapped 300. The kibbutz, a farming community, were no threat to Hamas. Hamas burned the houses down of innocent farmers just enjoying life. The Nova Festival was no threat to Hamas, but Hamas chose to terrorize and brutalize the attendees. We must support Israel here and abroad to recover from this evil. I am your police chief. I am here for you. I have your back. If you see something, if you see something, say something. Me and the sheriff work very well together. We have a decent sized department, but he's got assets that sometimes I may need. But I'm a phone call away, a phone call away. And if, if you feel threatened, call 911. Don't call the administrative number. You call 911, and a cop is coming your way. Thank you. Almost 28,000 so far. Let's double that. Come on. Let's now watch the video of where your money's actually going, the ears and the eyes, so you can control and help our soldiers with the drones that you are actually donating. So please watch this video. Thank you. You're saving our assets and you're saving us. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Hi, Shana Tova, Palm Beach Gardens. This is Shmaya. I'm here with Mendy and Yon. We're preparing for important missions in northern Israel, southern Lebanon. Appreciate all the help you guys have given us until now. We can use a little bit more. Uh, we want to be as effective as possible and bring everybody home safely. The next candle will be lit by Florida Chair and National Board Member of the Republican Jewish Coalition, my friend Barbara Feingold. There are moments 
that are so powerful that sometimes you just don't even have the right words. You might have the right thoughts, but it's hard to really conjure up what we have lived through this past year. For me personally and my family, my husband, Jeffrey of blessed memory, who many of you here knew well, passed away three years ago on October 7th. Little did I think that that would become a day for me that would take on having to now deal with the yurt sites of not just my husband, but of all those slaughtered, brutally slaughtered a year ago today. As Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said when he stood in the halls of Congress, and then when he stood at the UN, that going back to World War II, it was a fight against good and evil. That's how we all looked at it. But today, this is a fight against Western civilization and barbarians, barbarians. That's what we are dealing with. This is not a regular war. When people call it a war, no. This is an existential threat. And that's how we have to look at this. This is not something that's going away tomorrow but it has to go away soon enough. And the way it's gonna go away is because we have the modern state of Israel. We did not have that in the 1930s and 40s and prior to that. Oh yes, the Israelites were in the land of Israel going back 5,000 years ago. They came, they left, they were here, they were there, they were dispersed. And we became Jews in the diaspora and we did not have a real homeland to call our own. And we never had an army to back us, to fight for us. By giving us the modern state of Israel, that gave us power, that gave us the voice, that gave us unity. And that's what we have today. And when we talk about the Jewish people having one voice, we have it, the land of Israel and the IDF. And when last year these ridiculous terrorist groups that have cropped up and have been supported by Iran, the IDF, when they were attacked, they knew what they had to do. And we know now what we have to do. It takes money, it takes voices, it takes power, it takes leadership, it takes statesmanship. Senator Rick Scott, Congressman Brian Mast, and many others who support us and stand with us, Jew and non-Jew alike. We have to be thankful for these people, and we have to appreciate them and let them know it. Every one of them in Congress should be like them, but they aren't. We know where many of them stand, and we have to stand with those who stand with us. Rabbi and Rebetzin, your words are so meaningful, so powerful, so true. Rebetzin, you took my line that I spoke about earlier this morning when I was with Rick Scott at a round table. And I talked about it. Teshuvah, tefillah, tzedakah. What does that mean to us? Coming from our Torah, we are the people of the Torah. That's what the rest of the world doesn't like. We have the voice from God. We have the words, and we have to use them. We are one strong people. They've tried to eliminate us, but they couldn't. They tried it again, but they couldn't. They tried it last year, but they can't, and they won't, because we will stand one united Jewish people, whether we're in Israel or in the United States and in other lands around the world because we will continue, and we will thrive, and we will make this world a better place and make a difference. A few years ago, my husband and I were in Munich, Germany. We went there for treatment for him, a place I never thought I'd want to step foot in. 
yet they had the right treatment for him. And when I came and visited Dachau, the Holocaust Memorial, and the Jewish Community Center, a young uh, German said to me, who was our guide, what did you think of that? Wasn't that amazing? What did you think of the Holocaust Memorial? What did you think of that new Jewish Community Center? I said, what did I think? I said, I'm going to tell you what I think. I think Hineni, I'm here. That's what I think. And that's what we all have to remember. Hineni, we are here. And we stand with Israel. Am Yisroel Chai. God bless us all. the interesting thing about television. Well, it's after 8 o'clock, so the cameras are off, but we're all still here. <laughs> and my committee, our committee, as we did all the work, at one point said, Sid, would you please light a candle? And I said it would be one of the greatest honors of my life. So I am lighting a candle. Or not. See, we're all good at certain things and not so good at others, but. And with that, thank you. I'm going to call the Rebbitzin and the rabbi to come up to finish the five other candles and to take us into the next hour and the hour that is not commemoration but is hope. Seeing the frightening amount of anti-Semitism in the world can be really overwhelming. But when it comes to fighting our enemies, the Torah tells us multiple times, Al tira mehem, do not be afraid of them. It says, Hashem oz le'amo yiten, Hashem yivarech et amo bashalom. God strengthens us. God gives us strength. And with this strength, through this strength, we achieve peace. It is not through ceasefires. It is not through giving away land. But it is through strength that we will achieve strength, that we will achieve peace. When Israel rises up in strength to defend itself without apologizing, the world rises up to give her a standing ovation. We conclude tonight's ceremony with a prayer for peace, a prayer that our politicians have the strength to do what needs to be done, a prayer that God protect our brothers and sisters in the Holy Land, that he return all our fighting men and women swiftly and safely. That Jews around the world experience peace. And finally, we pray that every single one of the hostages come home now. The video that will be playing behind the song are the names and the faces of all the hostages. And if you know the song, please sing along. We're not on TV anymore, so it doesn't matter what it sounds like anyway, right? It's all good. Depends on the music. Oh, shalom, bimroma. Oh, 
יעשה שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל ואמרו ואמרו אמן יעשה שלום יעשה שלום שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל יעשה שלום יעשה שלום, שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל. אומרים רומם, הוא יעשה שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל. ואמרו, ואמרו אמן. יעשה שלום, יעשה שלום, שלום עלינו. ישראל יעשה שלום, שלום שלום, שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל. עשה שלום במרומיו, הוא יעשה שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל. ואמרו, ואמרו אמן. יעשה שלום, יעשה שלום. שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל יעשה שלום, שלום שלום, שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל ימרו אמן. that we always hope for a brighter tomorrow. As Jews, we are filled with the conviction that our best and brightest days lie ahead of us and not behind us. L'chaim to a new year. L'chaim to a new beginning. L'chaim to the end of this war. L'chaim to the fulfillment of the promise that you'll find on every bridge and every train station in Israel. Am ha-netzach yenatzeach, the eternal nation will most certainly endure. We have outlived every one of our enemies so far, and we will outlive this enemy as well. L'chaim am Yisrael chai. Thank you all for joining us here tonight at this very moving and difficult ceremony. I thank our amazing committee, our extraordinary speakers, and each and every one of you. I thank our friends, Americans, and around the world that have stood by our side because greater and more painful then the hurt of our enemies is the silence of our friends, and we are grateful to the good citizens of America and around this world. Please join us as we step outside for a very special celebratory dessert, celebrating the future and the miracles that lie in store for us and all the people of Israel. Shalom. Thank you. <laughs>